You're treading on the ground. That's that's yeah. gone. Yeah. I knew there were some water bottles. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that vegetable reverse cycle. So it's actually a little bit of a microwave. Why is there a microwave? Why is there a microwave? Why is there a microwave? There should be water over there. Oh, we can just show about a second and see if it's possible. All right. Justice delivered. <laughs> um, but in, in the book of Esther, it's like perfection. So we'll talk about that in a moment, but let's have a quick prayer together first. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for the good day you've given us. We're thankful for the opportunity now to be here together as brothers and sisters, to encourage one another, and to devote this hour to studying your word and considering the things that are in. Lord, we thank you for preserving your word for us. We thank you for revealing to us the way you want us to live, the way you want us to act and to treat others, the words you want us to have, the thoughts you want us to have. Help us, Lord, to be diligent and to be um, very serious in our efforts to understand your word better and to conform our lives to it. Help us, Lord, to be imitators of Jesus, help the world to see Jesus living in us, Help us to be encouragers. Help us to always be looking to do good, be in the service of others. Help us, Lord, to always give glory to you in our words and actions and our deeds. Lord, we pray for those of our number who are suffering. We pray for those of our number who are worried, those who are dealing with difficulties. We have many in our number to care about, and Lord, we pray that you'll bless them, give them peace. And Lord, we pray that you will use us as your hands and your feet to minister to them however we can. We all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we have been talking much longer than I was supposed to about the Israelites. And last time we went through this list of all of the various grumblings that they had done. Um, since being saved miraculously, 
uh, by God when he parted the sea and allowed the Israelites to pass through and then allowed the sea to fall on the Egyptians and wipe them out. Um, since that monumental event, um, it didn't take long, about six weeks or so, and they started grumbling and they started complaining and saying, you know, why have you brought us out here, Moses? Why has God brought us out here just to die, just to starve to death? It would have been better for us if we had just stayed slaves, because then at least we knew we had pots of food, and we had plenty of, to eat, and life wasn't so bad that we told you not to bring us out. And of course, none of that was true. Um, they may have had pots of food, but they also had um, an unreasonable amount of work to do, and they were slaves. And so the whole situation was better for them, so we looked at they grumbled for food, and then God provided. He gave them manna, he gave them quail, they grumbled for water, he gave them water. Um, they didn't grumble for justice, but we know they were grumbling for justice in Exodus 18, and Moses was providing that. Uh, and then in Exodus 32, we saw that they wanted idols. Moses had been gone too long talking with God, even though they knew God was there with Moses and they saw his presence, they were complaining because Moses wasn't there and they, they got Aaron to make for them a, a statue, an idol of uh, gold um, in the form of a cow. And they proclaimed that that was their gods. And they said, furthermore, these are your gods who led you out of Egypt. Um, and so wanted all of that. And we had these, we looked at a few verses there where First of all, Moses came back to them after talking with God and told them, God is going to make a covenant with us and he's going to continue to bless us and protect us and give us all of the things he promised us as long as we're true to him. And they said in Exodus chapter 19, they said, absolutely, whatever the Lord says, we're going to do. And then in Exodus 20, he laid out his, he start to, started to lay out his law and he pronounced the Ten Commandments. And the first two of those, recall, are what? Have no idols. <laughs> no Have idols. No other God. No so. other God. And make no idols. Those were the first two things that God said to the people. And, and they had said, we're going to agree. And then we read, um, I don't know how much time has elapsed, but we read that you know enough time went by, and they were frustrated. Where was Moses? And so they wanted God. But what they really ended up doing was just engaging in revelry. They made these gods, they were worshiping this cow, uh, this image of a cow. They were um, engaging in immorality, and it just became a, a, a very pagan thing. And of course, Moses um, saw that God told him something's going on, go check it out. And Moses was, you know, or um, Joshua said, oh, you know, that's, what am I hearing? Is that music? And Moses said, that's not music, that's a bunch of fools. And um, they fixed that. And then we saw, we got here, we didn't really look at it, but what was the scene in Numbers chapter 13? They were, they were concerned about their safety. What was the story um, in this passage? What's the scene? <coughs> They've approached the promised land, and they're right there. He sent the spies in, and they came back, and 10 said no, and two said yes. Yeah, they said so, Moses picked some men to serve as spies, sent them in. Included in that list was Joshua, his chief lieutenant, and Caleb of the tribe of Judah, and then some other men, and they went in. And what was the report? Was the report, this land is great? It was great land, but there were giants. Yeah, the they said the land is everything God said it was. It is flowing with milk and honey. Look at these amazing grapes. How big were the grapes? Two, 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 two. Yeah, they had to carry them on a post. They were so large. It was awesome. It was everything that they expected it would be, um, except I guess they weren't expecting giants, and they weren't expecting cities that were as fortified as they were. And so what was the response when they saw all of that? Fear. Absolute fear. Absolute lack of faith that God could deliver, right? Did Joshua and Caleb say, oh, you guys, you're exaggerating. They weren't that big. No, we can... We can whip those guys. Was that their response? No, their response was, yeah, they're big, but 
with God, we can make this. We can, we can take this. God has promised it. Let's go do it. They were anxious to do it. And of course, the ten spies said no. And it got to such a point where now we have a lot of Israelites, most Israelites, complaining and saying, what are we, why did God bring us here? Why did he bring us all the way to this land just to have us be killed? You know, we're grasshoppers in their sight. They're giants. We're tiny. We can't do this. Um, it would be better. And they weren't just pining for the old days now, were they, of going back to Egypt and talking about the greatness. They were saying, let's pick a new leader and let's go back to Egypt. And they were clearly now in a, in a full-on mutiny. They were going to just kill off Joshua, Caleb, Moses, Aaron, pick new leaders and head back and, I guess, submit themselves to slavery. And, and just say, hey, we're back. We'll make bricks. We'll build cities as long as we get our pots of food, right? And so they were grumbling for their safety. What was, what was God's response to that? He was going to kill them all, wasn't he? He was. So this is another time he told Moses, I'm just done with these people. I'm going to wipe them out. Once again, Moses interceded. He said, don't do that, God. You know, what, what's, what's the consequence if you do that? then everybody's going to look at you and mock you because, oh, you let them out of Egypt just to kill them. So he said, don't do that, please, which God relented. But what was God's decision? What was his judgment? Wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Yeah. He said, those of you who complained, those of you who <coughs> doubted, you won't see the land. He said, you accused me of bringing here, you here to kill your children. He said, your children who you said I would kill, they'll see the land, but you won't. So everybody 20 years and younger was able to make it. All of the adults, they were going to die off in the wilderness. He said their carcasses would just rot in the wilderness. And after 40 years, we'll put in a new batch. And, and the new crew will come in, and they, you know, they're not going to be the ones who can so, pretty significant, we talked about that, the complaint. You know, they were, they were concerned about their safety. They were concerned um, about their ability to uh, do what God said they could do. They were concerned about God's ability to do what he said he would do. Um, but they also looked back. And they, they decided that all of the begging and pleading that they had, all of the effort they had to get out of Egypt, they decided, I'm going to go back into that mess. And I'm going to, we're, we're going to willfully submit ourselves back to slavery and once again subject ourselves to what we were trying to get away from. Which is, I mean, to us, you know, a hindsight, of course. They, they saw the miracle of God every morning with the manna. Every morning. And, you know, from the, from the description, it tasted really good. You like honey, yeah. Well, you know, bread, you know, bread and honey, but but still, it was there every morning. Mm -hmm. And I got up, you know, I'd go out, pick what they uh, what they needed, and brought it back yep. every morning. And of course, the water, and then you know, we can't forget the quail, <laughs> you know, coming out. Oh, and they saw just, the presence of God that every morning. They Literally. saw the presence of and and the, the pillar of fire at night and the cloud mm -hmm. during the day. Every day, they saw that, and yet they still grumbled. I, uh, it's just baffling to us. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's easy to accuse. Um, and, and we don't have it. In hindsight, we're like, well, of course we wouldn't. But why do we think we would? We grumble now. What makes us think we have? We, we grumble now. We, we have a lack of faith now. We'll talk more about this in a minute. Two more I'm just going to gloss over. We have two more examples where they grumbled again for water. This was the time when Moses got frustrated and he didn't do what God commanded him. Instead of speaking to the rock, which God said, go speak to the rock and water will come out, he hit it again. Water still came out. But then God told Moses, well, why didn't he do what I said? And so Moses was now withheld from entering the promised land. But they got their water again. And then they grumbled again about food. And so we see this just this cycle. <coughs> Uh, and we see kind of the same cycle in the book of Judges, don't we? Um, fall away, grumble, grumble, grumble. Okay, I'm going to save you. I'm going to help you, you know, get over yourselves. And then they're good, and then they fall away. It's just a cycle. So, do we do that? 
this isn't a perfect example, but it's a personal example, so I'll share it. Um, I don't know how many years ago, 10 years ago, um, I used to always think I was dying. Um, <laughs> until just recently, I, anytime anything was wrong, I thought, well, I have cancer and I'm going to die soon. And I've had leg cancer, I've had brain cancer, I've had, neck can I've had everything. And I'm not minimizing cancer because I know it's terrible, but I always thought I had cancer. And Melissa would always say, you don't have cancer. Well, how would you know? So one time, though, I thought I had cancer. I had this, like, this weird lump. And um, Melissa was like, eh, I don't know. You should go to your doctor. So then I really thought I had cancer. <laughs> and I went to my doctor, and she was always very even keeled and um, tolerated me. And she said, I don't know. You should go get that looked at. And so then I thought for sure, OK, I actually do have cancer. Um, I called. Uh, tower radiology. She said, you need to go have, look at, have some thing done. And they said, well, we can get you in like two weeks or whatever, a long time. And I, I said, I could die right then. I need to know what this is. <laughs> so I was very insistent, and they got me in the same day. And then I did the whole test, and then a nurse came in and said, the radiologist will take a look at this, and you know, within a week or so, we'll call your doctor and let you know. And I thought, well, that's too long. So I was very insistent to the point that the radiologist came in and talked to me directly. But keep in mind that the entire time I had been praying and I had this deep sense of how inferior I am, how little control I have, how great God is, how, how everything is in God's hands. And I made promises and I was just, I, I really understood my place and I understood how helpless I was. Um, what do you think happened the moment the radiologist said, oh, it's nothing. Don't worry, you're good. You didn't believe him? Oh, no, I believed him. Oh, okay. And it was just like, okay, well, I'm through that. And all of a sudden, I was just, I wasn't thinking about God anymore. You know, I was so dependent, and then um, I just, it just dissipated. It just vanished. And, and we get like that. The Israelites got like that. They needed God. He was providing. You mentioned every morning they woke up there was manna but I think they probably forgot that's a blessing God gave me today you know today he gave me bread today he gave me quail today his his fire and his his pillar and the fire protected me from the scorching sun and from the cold of the desert you know and, and today he guided us they forgot it because it was so common and then they run into a little problem and they grumble and they complain so not a perfect example, but is there something here with generations? The one who went through it understood it, but next generation says, "Well, it wasn't that bad." Uh, we see it happen here: the Holocaust, all the things have gone through the mm -hmm. depression, and, uh, world, the world wars. You tell kids now, like, yeah, it's hard to conceive of, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and it's 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 funny now. Um, a lot of younger folks don't even have any knowledge other than what they've heard of, of 9-11. You know, and, and I remember, you know, when those, that happened, um, it was very odd, but for a brief moment, the entire country was really united. And we were all, we all realized, wow, we're, in a, we're vulnerable. We're in danger. Um, a lot of people got religious. A lot of people put aside petty differences. A lot of silliness that a year before, um, you know, George Bush and Al Gore fighting, that was all gone. And just for a moment, now we don't conceive of it. You know, we don't think about it. Um, and the same with any of these events. It's, it's difficult when your generations were moved. But I guess even though these people were generations and generations, hundreds of generations before us, I don't think human nature has changed that much. I think human beings are still kind of the way we are. And if we think that the Israelites were just exceptionally horrible, and just how stupid could they be? Um, I don't know that we would be different. I mean, go forward 1,500 years, people witness Jesus Christ, raise people from the dead, and heal people, and, and do miracles, feed thousands of people out of essentially nothing. Did everybody believe? Did everybody submit to that? So, it's it would be... I think it would be very foolish of us to think we couldn't fall into that same trap. All right, so 
Here's a question. What was the root problem for the Israelites? And they always say there's no wrong answers, but there is one right answer on the screen, which David tasked me with talking about. And so I want to at least raise it, and then we'll talk more about it later. But what's the problem? Their heart was not a God. Okay. I heard their heart was not with God. I heard something else, but I didn't hear it. Ungrateful. You win the prize. Congratulations. Ungratefulness. And we can look at these stories and we can think of a lot of issues. But the one we want to talk about is a lack of gratitude. And, of course, the question is what causes ungratefulness? The monotony of life. Okay. You wake up. Again, you know, they, they, have, they had manna every morning. Most of us have a good night's rest and a sunrise. That's true. <laughs> every day. You know, so what's the difference? There are people who go to bed and wondering if maybe they won't make it through the day. That's true. Yeah. There are people who presently live up in New England and have to suffer through whatever terrible weather they're dealing with, right? There are people who um, can barely get out of bed, um, if at all. Yeah. And, but those things for us, for most of us, it's just normal. It's common. Yes, sir. People go about all the trucks on the highway, but if there were no trucks on the highway, there would be. <laughs> We'd be grumbling about no food and yeah. grocery stores, right, and supply chain issues, which we grumbled about, by the way, didn't we, yes. the last year. Um, yeah, there's, it's, we get so accustomed to what we have, we don't realize what we have. And, and I did this, Melissa and I commented on this not too long ago. We, we went into this mode where we were trying to get rid of stuff. Because we realized when we moved into our current house, this was before kids, we had one living room that was 100% empty and two bedrooms that were 100% empty, nothing in them. And somehow we have filled that house to the point I have built three sheds by hand and bought a plastic shed. And they're full of stuff. And it's like, how did this happen? You know, but over time, you just get used to stuff. And then all of a sudden, well, I don't have enough, I need this. Maybe? Wow, it's just gonna, what can cause ungratefulness is just not taking the time to count your main blessings. Yeah, and that's, we're gonna talk about solutions to this in a while, but that is, yeah, stopping and taking stock of all I do have. It's overwhelming. Um, especially when you're having a garage sale, then you realize, wow, I have a lot of shirts. And I have a lot of stuff that I'm about to sell for a nickel. That, um, I didn't even know I had, and I don't even care about it. When's this garage sale? I'll let you know. You, I'll, I'll give you all of the stuff just to get rid of it. Okay. Yeah. So we'll talk more about ungratefulness, and we'll talk about the solution to ungratefulness um, in a future lecture. I know you don't. <laughs> Sounds like you. You may have to get permission first. <laughs> this is an inside joke. Okay. All right. I'll leave it at that. All right. So let's talk about Haman. The book of Esther. We'll get into Haman tonight. We'll, we'll likely wrap this up someday, and then we're going to move on to another character. Haman was a very important noble uh, in the Persian Empire. He served um, King Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus. We know him as Xerxes. Ahasuerus. Um, we know him as Xerxes the first. Xerxes was the son of Cyrus the Great, um, and he was the grandson of Darius the Great. Darius was the one who, um, when the Medes and Persians came in and conquered Babylon, Darius was the king at that time. He replaced Belshazzar, who saw the writing on the wall, um, and Darius was also the one whom Daniel served. And uh, this was the time that Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, was under <coughs> Darius, the uh, Persian king. Darius. So Xerxes comes from a tremendous lineage. Darius, Cyrus, and then him. Um, very powerful. The nation, the Persian nation expanded immensely um, under them. Xerxes ruled from 486 to 465 until he was assassinated by Artabanus, um, ironically, the commander of his bodyguard. So he did a very bad job uh, at what he was paid to do, but he was assassinated taken out. Um, he ruled from the city of Susa. I think your Bible may also say something like Shushan or something, but Susa was where it was, which is on 
present day, it's on, almost on the border of Iran and Iraq, um, a couple hundred miles to the east of the Tigris River. This is the Persian Empire at this time, and you can see it's quite extensive. Susa is right there, kind of in the middle of the country, at least east to west. The Babylonians had this entire area, the Fertile Crescent. Um, Persia conquered that, then they went into Babylon, didn't have Egypt. Persia went in and took over Egypt and pushed all the way up to Greece, Macedon. Um, who did they run into when they got there, by the way? Bonus points. Uh, Alexander the Great. Um, he was the one. And then pretty much within a, a phenomenal short period of time, Alexander took over all of this. Um, he became uh, the pharaoh of Egypt. He became the king of Persia. He was the king of uh, Macedonia. Um, he had lots of titles. Um, and you can see, though, they, they had pretty much from the Indus River over in India all the way over to Greece, all the way down to Libya. And Egypt. Massive, massive empire. Um, many, many, many um, languages represented here, many different cultures represented here, all under the influence of uh, Xerxes and his lineage. This is um, a picture of some of the excavation from modern day Susa. It's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site that's protected, that's well established, lots of archaeology going on there. Um, this is a picture of one of those buildings. Here's some more. Um, this one, according to the internet, is actually uh, the palace complex. Um, that they have excavated the, um, a lot of the uh, foundations and walls there. Artist rendering of what it used to be like. Um, and so, this right here would have been the King's Gate that we read about where Mordecai sat um, and within kind of the palace complex. We'll talk about that more. The very impressive city, of course, very significant. Uh, <coughs> these are the characters, Xerxes, King of Persia, Esther, who was the secretly Jewish queen to him. Haman is the petulant little crybaby. And Mordecai was uh, Esther's cousin, but he really served as her father figure. When her parents died, he, he raised her as his own daughter. Polaroids. What's that? Polaroids. No, no. <laughs> Snapshots from, uh, there was apparently some Hallmark level movie made about Esther. Okay. Um, and then this is from the movie 300. So, uh, there you go. Um, probably all accurate. <laughs> so, very quickly, we'll just go through the story of Esther, kind of in, in, the, in the order that the Bible presents. So, three years into his reign, Xerxes throws a massive celebration. We're told it's 180 days long, and he invites governors and rulers and nobles from all over the Persian Empire to come and, and see the splendor of, of Xerxes, and of, of Susa, and the, and the power and the wealth of the Persian Empire. And so he's throwing this for a long, long time, uh, six months, this just ongoing festival feast. We're told after that ended, he had a special seven day long feast that was really just for the people of the city of Susa, where he lived. And we're told that he invited everybody. The scriptures say both great and small. Everybody from that city was there um, to see the splendor and to um, enjoy his hospitality. He had a queen, her name was Vashti. <coughs> she was beautiful. He was probably a little drunk and wanted to show her off. He sent for her to come and to show off for all of the people, and she refused, uh, which was a bad idea. You don't refuse um, the king, certainly don't refuse a Persian king. And so he was, he was angry, he was enraged, the scriptures tell us. He had seven governors who were there with him, and these were his closest advisors. The scriptures named them, give them all their names, and he asked them what to do, and they said, you need to, you need to remove her. Not kill her, but just take her title away from her. Strip her of, her of her title and pick yourself a new queen. So he did this in a very public and an irrevoc irrevocable way. Remember, he said multiple times that when, uh, uh, in the law of the Medes and the Persians, when the king wrote a decree, it couldn't be overturned. It couldn't be undone. It was what it was. And so he did that. But why did he do this? Why was there advice? to make this such a public spectacle. Didn't yeah. they say they didn't? Just that example for people who never disobey. Yeah, 
But what, what specifically were they worried about? Their You're wives. right. Their wives. Their wives. They were like, hey, if word gets out that Vashti dissed you in front of all your guests, what are our wives going to do? And so they're like, you need to make an example of her. Um, I thought that was pretty funny that they were that fearful of like this uprising of, of wives just rejecting their husbands and just taking control of themselves. And so he's like, yeah, okay, you're right. So he made it a decree and she was deposed and that was that. So in chapter two, he gets advice um, to, to look for a new queen. Find somebody who's beautiful, and, and we won't read the chapter, but remember there was this lengthy discourse about like this regimen that they had to go through. It was like a year-long process of, of putting oils on their faces for six months, and then something else, and then eating this certain food, and it was like this very long process to kind of get all of these potential candidates to be his new queen ready to be presented to Xerxes. So, Esther was one of those candidates. So she goes to Mordecai and she, you know, she's like, well, I'm a candidate to become a queen. And so he encourages her, great, but don't tell them you're Jewish. You need to keep that close to the best. And she does, she keeps it, she keeps it a secret. She doesn't release the fact that she's a Jew at all during this years long process. He ends up finally seeing her. They had to be invited. And we're told that he loved her more than all the others. He saw her, he was blown away by her beauty. I'm sure she was exceptionally beautiful. I'm also sure that she was an exceptionally kind and good person and just all around great person to have. So he's blown away, he selects her. Note this is now seven years into his reign. So this is four years after he got rid of Vashti. So he played the long game, now, a lot of patience. I'm sure he had a lot to do, but long time. So we read that Mordecai spent a lot of time kind of in this palace complex. He would hang out near the king's gate. Um, and when, we, when there was something happening regarding Esther, he was kind of close by to, to hear and get the news, what's going on. You know, they had eunuchs who were in charge of all of the possible brides, and he would talk to them and get news and relay information that way. And we read about that coming up. One day he's sitting there, and there's two of the king's eunuchs, and they're plotting to kill Xerxes. No idea what they're upset by, but they're, they're plotting to kill him. So Mordecai hears this, and he said, well, that's a bad thing. He tells Esther, he said, you need to relay this message to the king, but get the message out that these two guys, and their names are mentioned, they're going to, they're trying to kill the king. And so she, she takes it along, she gets the message passed, along to uh, Xerxes. Upon investigation, they find out, well, in fact, they were plotting. It was true, and so they're, they're executed. Some of your scriptures will say they were um, hung by gallows. The more I was reading, one of the versions I saw said they were, they were stuck on a pike. Um, and the more I read, that was what they did. The Persians didn't hang people by their necks like in the 1800s here. Um, they put up a stick, sharpened one end of it, and stuck your body on it. And, and you were left there to die like that if you weren't already dead. And so that's what happened to these two. They were executed by being impaled upon spikes. And then all of this was written down in the Book of Chronicles. Just like our Bible has a Book of Chronicles, kind of laying out the history of the kings. Persia had the same thing, most, most nations do. And so this whole story is written about the time that Mordecai saved the king's life by notifying him of this assassination plot. It'll come into effect later. Chapter three, we're introduced to Haman. He's an official. Uh, we're told he's a noble. He has the, he has the ear of Xerxes. Um, and in fact, he's, he is promoted to what seems like one of the highest positions you can possibly have within the country. He is put in charge of all the governors. So he's a very powerful person, very influential. And Xerxes makes a decree that when, when Haman passes by, everybody has to rise, they have to bow, they have to pay homage to him, they have to give their respects to him. And so, of course, everybody does, except Mordecai. We read that Mordecai won't even give him the pleasure of standing up, he just sits there. And 
you ever seen the picture of the Nazi rally with hundreds of people giving the salute to Hitler and then there's one guy standing there with his hands in his pockets? Yeah. That's kind of Mordecai. Everybody else is standing uh, and bowing and offering the, the appropriate um, praise and adoration. But Mordecai doesn't. And so one day there's a couple of the servants of the king in this palace area who no they, they've noticed this many times and they approached him and why do you never stand? And the only thing we're told in scripture is that he told them he was a Jew. And I don't know if that's the reason to not stand, if that was his excuse, or if it was just to, to share the information that now somebody knows that he's Jewish. And I think that's probably what it is. I don't think he had a law against standing and, and offering some respect to the king, because we know Daniel offered respect to the king, right? We know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego offered respect to but nevertheless, he informs them that he's a Jew. These two guys go back to Haman and tell him, hey, this Mordecai dude, he never stands for you, he never bows, he never does what he's supposed to do. The king said he's supposed to do all that. And also, guess what, he's a Jew. So what is Mordecai's response? He's gonna just kill all the Jews. He's, he, he's not, the Bible says he wasn't satisfied to just to humiliate and to harm Haman. He is now mad at all the Jews. And he wants to kill all the Jews because of Mordecai's lack of respect for him. Though I'm sure there were plenty of Jews in Susa who also bowed to him and offered him respect and all those things. Um, but Haman, or Mordecai wouldn't. So we read 12 years. This has been a long time uh, between these sections of the book. But 12 years into the reign of Xerxes, Haman convinces Xerxes to make a decree. Um, to, and he just tells him, he tells Xerxes, there's this race of people, you know, they're not, they're not aligned with us, they're not like us, they don't, they don't do what we want them to do, they're a danger, so I want, I want you to make a decree that can't be reversed about them. And Xerxes just kind of, I don't know the full context, of course, but he says, do whatever you think is fit. Now keep in mind, Haman is an important official. He is, he is over the governors, he is a trusted advisor. I don't know that Xerxes at this point realizes he's a little loose and he's, you know, he's, he may not make the best decisions because he's been entrusted with a lot of power and a lot of authority and things are going well so far for the Persians so Haman is probably, you know, probably not unreasonable for Xerxes to do what he did which is to say, here's my signet ring, here's my seal, you make it and just send it out to the whole empire, put it in all the languages hundreds of languages, just send it out so everybody can see it. So he makes that decree, um, and they, he casts lots, and this is the first month of the year, we're told. Well, 12 months later, on the 13th day of the 12th month of Adar, you see a Jew, you can kill him. If you kill him, you can take all their stuff, you can plunder them. Basically, it's open season on all the Jews in the Persian Empire. So, pretty serious, pretty serious. Chapter 4, when that proclamation goes out, the people in, in Susa, of course, they're like, what the heck is that? I mean, that's crazy. Mordecai hears it, and he's, he's very despondent. He goes into mourning um, because of this, where sackcloth does the ashes. He's completely um, devastated by this, you know, knowing that in 12 months, there's going to be this just mass carnage against our people. Esther hears that Mordecai is distressed and that he's in mourning, and so she wants to figure out what's going on. She sends a messenger. Um, there's some back and forth, but basically he sent a copy of the decree, and he told her, here's what's happening. You know, he's, he's, this decree is allowing us to be killed. And he says, you have to intercede. You have to do something for us. Um, and remember, that's where we have that famous mini speech where he said, you know, it's such a time as this, maybe that's why you're here because this was going to happen and God put you here to save us and to protect us. She wasn't keen on that and she told him, if I go to the king without being invited, what happens? You can, she can be killed. Yeah, I can be killed. You don't just show up um, and talk to the king. You have to be invited. Um, but she says, I'm going to do it. You know, I'm going to do it for you. Um, oh, there it is. Don't you... Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all of the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. 
interesting amount of faith he has. He's telling her, you need to help fix this problem. She's hedging a little. He says, listen, if you don't, God's going to fix it somehow. And if you don't participate in fixing it, then you're going to fall by the sword too. And so she agrees. Um, she says, give me a few days. I want you to pray and fast for me. And, and, and then I'll go approach it. So chapter 5, she has done her few days of preparation. And true to her word, Esther walks out to Xerxes. And um, fortunately, he's happy to see her. He, he extends his scepter. And he says, come on in here and tell me what you want. And he's very magnanimous, isn't he? Say what you want. Up to half the kingdom, I'll give it to you. I'll give you anything you want. And she didn't go straight into the, hey, there's this terrible thing that's about to happen in a few months where we're going to all be killed. What's her request? Let's go to dinner. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to throw a banquet. I would like you and Haman. I want you all to join me. I want you all to be part of this banquet. And, of course, he, he agrees to that. Haman, of course, he's like super stoked, isn't he? He's like, oh, the queen has invited me. And he's super, he's just high as can be on this. And he's leaving. But what does he see? Mordecai. He sees that jerk Mordecai just sitting there, won't stand up, won't give him honor. And so he he's just becomes a little whiny crybaby at this point. Even though he's about to, even though he's in the position of power and authority he is, even though he essentially speaks for the king, even though he's about to have a banquet thrown by the queen in his honor, he still can't get over this one dude who won't give him what he thinks is due to him. So he goes back and he's talking to his wife and his friends, and he says in chapter 5, verse 11, Then Haman told them of his great riches, the multitude of his children, everything in which the king had promoted them, and how he had advanced, uh, he had advanced him above the officials and servants of the king. Moreover, Haman said, besides, Queen Esther invited me, no one but me to come in with the king to the banquet that she prepared. And tomorrow, I, again, uh, I am again invited by her, along with the king. Yet all this avails me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. So he has just done what we talked about a moment ago. He's counted all his blessings. Look at everything he says. I'm rich. I have a multitude of children. <coughs> I guess that's a blessing. Everything in which the king has promoted me and made me this ruler over many. I have all of this great stuff. Esther invited me to this banquet, and then she invited me to another one tomorrow. Nobody else, just me and the king. He's, he's living a great life, isn't he? But all of this avails me nothing. He just can't get over one person who isn't um, stepping into, into line exactly the way he wants. And so he's very upset at this Jew. And they encouraged him, you know what, make a gallows 50 cubits tall, massive, massive, and just go ask Xerxes if you can, if you can execute him there. And so he built it in front of his home, and, and he's ready to do that. Chapter 6, as you know, Xerxes has a bout of insomnia, um, so he gets up and he decides he's going to read from the book of Chronicles. They get to the story of Mordecai helping him preventing that assassination. And so he, he says to his servant, he says, did we do anything about that? Did we, the guy deserves something special. Did we do anything? And the servant said, no, we didn't do anything. So Haman comes in right on cue, steps right in, and Xerxes says, hey, Haman, you're my trusted <coughs> advisor. There's a guy I really want to honor. I want to give special consideration to. He's, he's pleased me greatly. What should I do? And what is Haman's response? It's me. Oh, yeah. He's like, oh, you're talking about me? Okay, well, let me tell you, king, if I were you, here's what I would do. I would give him so much honor. I would get a robe that you wore and put it on him. And I would take a horse that you rode and put it on him. And then I would have one of your nobles go all around the city and proclaim how great this man is. And look what, look what the king does for those who please him and give him all this special adoration. And so, hey, Xerxes tells him, that's great advice. I want you to do that for Mordecai. Mordecai saved my life a number of years ago, and so I want you, because you're my most trusted official, everybody knows you, I want you to exalt him on my behalf. And so Haman has to do this. Um, he's humiliated, 
But at least he still has the banquet later that day, right? And so he gets to do that. We read that, by the way, Mordecai was not happy with this at all. <laughs> when he got off the horse, he went back to mourning. He was very upset. And then you know the, the uh, story. Esther's banquet is a success. Xerxes keeps telling her, listen, you want something. Tell me what you want. So she finally gets the courage and she says, listen, my people, myself and all my people, we're at risk of annihilation. Somebody is plotting to kill us all. Xerxes is angry. He loves her. He's angry. Who on earth would do this? He demands to know who, who is threatening you. And then she says, he is. Haman is. He's the one. I'm a Jew. He's threatening to kill all of us. And so Xerxes now realizes, wow, that whole decree that he made me do, that was just him trying to enact his revenge. It was him trying to advance himself. So Xerxes, we're told, is enraged. He gets his storms off um, to get some fresh air. What does Haman do when Xerxes leaves? Begs the queen. Yeah, he runs over and he's begging. He's, he's in her lap. He's just begging for his life. At this point, he knows that she holds his life in his hands. Xerxes comes back in. He sees Haman all over, and he's like, now you molest my wife? And he's like, and so he's angry. So he says, what can we do? Um, one of his guards is right there, and he says, oh, by the way, there's this 50 cubit tall pipe just right in front of his house. We could put him there. And so Xerxes says to do that. All right? So that's the story of Haman. We'll talk application next time. Um, just so you know, we're going to be looking at, um, I'm planning on looking at